Right now on Morning News Now, face to face, two of the most powerful men in the world, President Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping, set to meet amid what's become a tense relationship. We'll take you through what's on the agenda and what each side is trying to gain and why the White House is already trying to lower expectations. Plus, IDF forces raid the biggest hospital in Gaza. The World Health Organization saying it has lost contact with the staff. This morning, Hamas blaming President Biden for the operation. How the White House is responding and what happens next for the patients and dozens of premature babies trapped by fighting. Breakthrough on Capitol Hill. The House passing a plan to avert a government shutdown in a bipartisan vote. The new GOP Speaker Mike Johnson pushing through a short-term spending bill with no cuts. We're breaking down the bill, what comes next, and why not all Republicans were on board. And Friends Forever, touching tributes to Matthew Perry by two of his co-stars, how they're remembering the late actor who brought smiles to millions. Good to see those tributes still pouring in. Yes. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin our show this morning with that high stakes meeting between President Biden and China's President Xi in California. Both leaders arrived in San Francisco yesterday for what will be their first face to face in a year. The talks are being held on the sidelines of the Apex Summit. Right now, several global issues are dividing the superpowers, creating strained relations. Speaking yesterday, President Biden was asked what he would describe as a successful outcome from his meeting with President Xi. Get back on a normal course of corresponding, being able to pick up a phone and talk to one another if there's a crisis, being able to make sure our military still have contact with one another. We can't take, as I told you, we're not trying to decouple from China. But we're, what we're trying to do is change the relationship for the better. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Matthew Frayer joins us now from San Francisco. So Janice, talk about the expectations here for this meeting. How high are they? What are some of the topics on the agenda? Well, expectations are actually quite low for those who are looking for major deliverables from this summit. There could be any host of issues on the agenda today, some of them thorny, like tariffs, uh, the tech export controls that have been imposed by the Biden administration, and certainly issues like Taiwan. Uh, but what we might see is some uh, announcement on low-hanging fruit, uh, namely a uh, joint task force to try and stem the flow of fentanyl precursors from China into the U.S. via Mexico, and as well the reestablishment of military-to-military -military contact uh, between the two countries uh, that was cut off by China in 2022 after Nancy Pelosi made that controversial visit to Taiwan. So those are the expected announcements to come out of this. Primarily, it's the fact that these two men are actually meeting that is going to be the main takeaway. Uh, relations hit an all-time low in this past year. So the, the very fact that they're going to be shaking hands and sitting at the same table for three to four hours discussing issues is seen as a step ahead towards stabilizing the relationship between the U.S. and China. So Janice, one area that there appears to be at least some consensus is climate change. We saw these countries issue a joint statement on that yesterday. What have we agreed on there? Well, climate was another one of those topics where uh, communication had been cut off after Nancy Pelosi's visit. It's now been reestablished, and this is important not only because John Kerry and his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinhua, have a good relationship. They, they talk quite often, uh, but there had been no formal uh, reestablishment of the climate working group. They're now saying that that is back on, so that's being seen as a step forward as well in meetings that they've had over the past week. They're saying that they're setting new global targets for renewables as well as an agreement on methane and plastic pollution. But it will be the fact that this working group is on again that uh, that people will be looking toward in terms of trying to now uh, have the U.S. and China move towards some of these mm. climate targets. All right. Janice, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we are a step closer this morning to avoid a government shutdown. The House of Representatives 
passed a stopgap funding bill on Tuesday ahead of the Friday deadline. The bill now goes to the Senate, where it is also expected to pass. And then the president is expected to sign it. The bill passed in the House by a vote of 336 to 95, with 93 Republicans voting against it. That's more GOP no votes than the last government funding bill in September, which you may recall led to Kevin McCarthy's demise as House Speaker. His successor, Mike Johnson, was pressed by reporters on those defections after yesterday's vote. Your first big bill, sir, how does it feel? We just had to get the job done. We'll do it day by day. Any concern about the number of Republican defections there were? We'll get our team together and, and run the agenda. We're ready to do that. How do you get your team together from here? You'll see. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us with the latest here. Hey, Julie, good morning. So walk us through what happened on the House floor yesterday. How did Speaker Johnson get the support needed to pass this funding bill? Well, guys, the day started off from, with a statement from the House Freedom Caucus, the conservative wing among House Republicans, and they said flat out they're not supporting this bill. But the, as the day went on, we started to hear more and more from Democrats, Democratic leadership saying this bill is not perfect. They thought the process was too system that Speaker Johnson set up was complicated and unnecessarily so. Uh, but regardless, they said that their members would support this bill. And sure enough, they did. Just two Democrats ended up voting against this continuing resolution in the House. Uh, Speaker Mike Johnson also spoke about this. He said, look, with his fragile majority, he wanted to do more. He wanted more cuts. Uh, but it's just not possible. Watch this. Getting us beyond the shutdown and making sure that government stays in operation is, is a matter of conscience for all of us. We, we owe that to the American people. I, I believe that we can fight on principle and do these things simultaneously. When you have a small majority, it requires some things are going to have to be bipartisan. But I think these are issues that every member of Congress should agree on. We, we are on an unsustainable track with our debt. Quickly, not only did Democrats end up overwhelmingly saving this bill in the end, but this really didn't even go through the regular process either. It didn't pass in the Rules Committee, the first procedural hurdle on Monday. That's why it had to pass under so-called suspension, meaning two-thirds of the House actually had to vote for it in order for it to pass. So you mentioned Democrats saving it. Has he now put himself at odds with members of his own party? Yeah, well, that's the big question now. I mean, this is virtually the same thing that ousted Speaker Kevin McCarthy went through just a couple of months ago. Even here, you actually had uh, less Republicans, or excuse me, yeah, less Republicans supporting this bill than they did in McCarthy's version. But Johnson still seems to be in this honeymoon period. And when you look at what this bill actually does, he's saying that this will for Senate Democrats not to pass this massive spending package at the end of the year will force them to work harder because it is staggered in these two tiers. You have some government agencies funded until January 19th. Others are running out of money in the beginning of February. This means we have two potential shutdowns uh, in our future. So this is going to mean that both sides, House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats are going to have to work really hard to prevent that from happening. Senator John Thune, who's the number uh, three House, number two House Republican, uh, excuse me, Senate Republican, actually said uh, that this is going to be in the same position uh, in January and February that they are now. So they really have a lot of work to do. Again, Ukraine, Israel, border security funding, none of that is in this bill. All of that is going to have to get done after. Julie, very quickly, let's talk about this bill that did pass. It's been called this laddered approach. How exactly is it going to work over the next couple months? Yeah, well, you just heard me talking about it a little bit, Joe. You have these staggered deadlines in uh, January and February. You see that on your screen. Uh, it doesn't have any of the national security priorities, especially that President Biden had wanted. And I'll tell you, Senate Republicans also wanted to keep that link. They are working right now on some border provisions. It remains to be seen whether that will be enough for House Republicans. On the Senate part, though, Joe, they do say they're going to try to pass this bill by the end of this week. By the end of this week, uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer had said uh, the bottom line is why they're supporting it, because there are no budget cuts, and that was really a red line for Democrats. All right, Julie, thank you so much. Tensions are clearly growing on Capitol Hill. Yesterday, a fight nearly broke out during a Senate hearing. On top of that, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy was accused of elbowing one of the GOP congressmen who ousted him from the top job. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles takes a closer look. We'll Chaos on Capitol Hill. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold on. Stop it. Is that your right. solution, every problem? 
a fight nearly breaking out at a hearing of the Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee between Republican Senator Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma and Teamsters Union President Sean O'Brien. Mullen, a former MMA fighter, challenging O'Brien after he seemed to threaten the senator on Twitter following a labor union hearing in June, writing, quote, greedy CEO who pretends like he's self-made, in reality just a clown and a fraud. Always has been, always will be. Quit the tough guy act in these Senate hearings. You know where to find me, anytime, any place, cowboy. Sir, this is a time, this is a place. If you want to run your mouth, we can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Committee oh, Chair on. Senator Stop. Bernie Sanders there stepping in before the two no, men no, could come down. to blows. Okay. Okay. You know, you're a United States senator. Sit down. Active. Oh, okay. okay. Sit down, please. All right. Can I respond? Mr. Hold Chairman. it. Hold it. If we can, no, I have the mic. Said. I'm sorry. This is Hold what it. he said. You'll have your time. Okay. Can I respond? Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> this is a hearing. And God knows the American people have enough of contempt for Congress. Let's not I don't make like it worse. Thugs. Mullen, unapologetic after the hearing, citing Congress's at times violent past. Are you concerned that that's the way the conversation is happening here on Capitol Hill? People's been fighting for a long time. I mean, go back to the 1800s, they used to have canings. It was legal to do duels. Um, if you have a difference, you have a difference. I have no hard feelings. It's not personal to me. He just challenged me, and I accepted the challenge. And in the House, a physical altercation between former Speaker Kevin McCarthy and one of the eight Republican congressmen who ousted him from power, Tim Burchett of Tennessee. Kevin McCarthy walked by and elbowed me in the kidneys as he walked by. An NPR reporter interviewing Burchett, capturing audio of that moment. Sorry, Kevin, didn't mean to elbow. Why'd you elbow me in the back, Kevin? Hey, Kevin, you got any guts? Jerk. I said, hey, Kevin. And then he didn't answer, and he heard me. And then I, I chased after him, and we had a few words. He just acted like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. McCarthy denying he ever hit Burchett intentionally. I did not run and hit the guy. I did not kidney punch him. If I would hit somebody, they would know I hit him. And now Matt Gates, the Florida congressman who led the revolt against McCarthy, filing an ethics complaint against him over the incident, despite not witnessing it in person and facing his own ethics complaint for alleged sexual misconduct and misuse of funds. I think ethics is a good place for Gates to be. Our thanks to Ryan Nobles for that report. Also well, in Washington yesterday, tens of thousands of demonstrators took to the National Mall for the March for Israel. It was the largest pro-Israel demonstration in the U.S. since the war with Hamas began. Supporters spoke out demanding the release of hostages and an end to anti-Semitic attacks in the U.S. The amount of anti-Semitism in America is something that I, in my life I never, ever thought I would see. I'm frightened. I'm frightened for everyone. I just think it's important for those of us that can to be here, because there's many people that cannot be here, and that's why we're here. Yesterday, the president sent a message directly to the hostages being held by Hamas, telling them, hang in there. We're coming. While well, we're learning new details this morning about Israel's raid of Gaza's largest hospital, defense forces began what officials are calling a targeted operation on the Al Shifa complex, where they believe Hamas leaders and other militants are hiding. But hundreds of people are still sheltering inside as doctors race to save patients with almost no supplies left. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons has the details. Hey there, good morning to you. Well, events are moving quickly this morning. Hospital officials say that Israeli troops stormed the Al Shifa hospital at 2 a.m. here. They say there are 650 patients, 22 of which are in intensive care, 400 medical staff, and thousands of displaced people at the hospital. The Israelis are saying this is an operation based on intelligence information, is precise and targeted, and is against Hamas in a specified area of the Shifa hospital. This morning, the Israeli Defense Force releasing edited images it says shows fighting in the Gaza Strip. And Gaza's health ministry, run by Hamas, sending video it says shows the intensive care unit of Al Shifa Hospital. A shell hit, he says. There's gas and heavy smoke. We're evacuating patients. NBC News cannot independently confirm what the footage shows. Israel announcing an operation to target, quote, terrorist activity at Al Shifa. Al Shifa is where doctors say 
36 premature babies are being cared for, with no power for incubators. One little boy, injured, was rescued from rubble. The doctor says four babies were born by caesarean, their mothers dead. The Israeli Defense Force releasing images from Al Shifa with soldiers' faces blurred. It says shows them carrying medical supplies into the hospital. Hours before Israeli forces moved in, the Pentagon saying U.S. intelligence believes Hamas and Islamic Jihad operate from Al Shifa. Hamas and PIJ members operate a command and control node from Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. They have weapons stored there and are prepared to respond to an Israeli military operation against the facility. Hamas denies the claim and outside Al Shifa, bodies have been piling up. This morning, Jordan says targeting a hospital is a war crime. The head of the UN's humanitarian affairs says he's appalled and the World Health Organization says it's deeply concerned. The UN says the Hamas terror attacks on October 7th and holding of hostages is also a war crime. And in Washington Tuesday, a massive and peaceful march showing solidarity for the hostages and protesting anti-Semitism. Organizers saying hundreds of thousands attended. Back in Israel, hostage families marching to Jerusalem this week. This is my mother, Shoshan, my sister, Adi, and her husband, Tal. And this is their son, Nave. He's, he is eight years old. This is Yahel. She's only three years old. Seven members of Yaval's family are held. His dad, murdered. This is the last picture of him I, I, I have. Meanwhile, after the Israeli operation began, the National Security Council providing NBC News with this statement, we do not want to see a firefight in a hospital where innocent people, helpless people, sick people, trying to get medical care they deserve, are caught in the crossfire. All right, Kirsten Menz, thank you so much. Let's bring in Dr. Am Amber Ali on from Paris for more on this. She is the Deputy Operations Manager of Palestine for Doctors Without Borders. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. We know Al Shifa is now considered non operational as it's being raided yes. by Israeli forces. What are you hearing from those inside the hospital? I'm hearing the same. There are, um, there are still medical staff and patients and internally displaced people who have been sheltering in Al Shifa for weeks now who are still currently inside the hospital, in the compound and inside the, the buildings of the hospital. So Doctors Without Borders is used to working in dangerous places around the world, but let's talk through what's possible both in this hospital in Al Shifa at this point, but also just generally in an environment like Northern Gaza. What is possible in terms of providing medical care? So I was in El Shifa about seven weeks ago, and it's a it's a huge hospital with uh, six huge buildings. It's a tertiary care center. It's a university hospital. It's used to providing um, all sorts of, of levels of care. Um, it is now completely rendered non-functional. Um, the amount of injuries in Gaza at this point are over 27, 29,000 due to the attacks on Shifa and um, and the attacks in the north. We are are out of communication, in fact, with the official numbers coming coming forward from um, from our sources. But we know that over 27,000 people were injured a few days ago, and the numbers are just piling up. In terms of medical um, aid and, and medical capacity there, we're talking about multiple types of injuries and what we call polytrauma. So this could be abdominal, thoracic, back, head, and limbs and these are the types of procedures and the types of injuries that require days weeks months even years of recovery which cannot be done in the circumstances that the patients are facing right now and those are just the injuries it doesn't even touch the the health effects of not having access to water and food which the the 2.2 million civilians who are present in gaza are are, are actively facing Another issue is fuel. U.S. officials say the United Nations is set to deliver fuel to Gaza today for the first time since this war started on October 7th. Will it make a difference in the north right now? Where can this fuel and, and any other resources that are getting into Gaza best be used right now? I think that the fuel needs to be. There are multiple priorities, and this is this is a huge consequence of this of the this, the status of this war right now. the The priority should be on running water. Um, the water facilities and on running hospitals so that we can treat the injured and, and deal with the huge um, health consequences. In terms of the fuel that's being allowed in, from my understanding, it's enough to run trucks to be able to receive 
um, uh, trucks like trucks across the border, but nowhere near what's needed to to uh, to address all of the needs um, in the in in the Gaza Strip right now. All right, Dr. <clears throat> Amber Allian, thank you for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Yes, we do. Thank you. Well, family members of Americans being held hostage in Gaza are now speaking out. NBC's Lester Holt sat down with them for an exclusive interview yesterday after their meeting at the White House. They are joined in their anguish, but also in the hope that their loved ones will return. Family members of the Americans being held hostage by Hamas in Gaza. I sat down with them in Washington for an exclusive interview. My name is Ronan and Orna Neutra. We're the parents of Omer Neutra. Uh, born and raised on Long Island and uh, was abducted in Gaza. My name is Yehuda Bainan. My daughter, Liat, and her husband, Aviv, were abducted from Kibbutz near Oz on October 7th. For 39 days, they've been living a nightmare. My name is Hannah Siegel. My uncle, Keith Siegel, and his wife, Adrian, were abducted from Kibbutz Kafaraza on October 7th. My name is Yael, and this is Roy Alexander. We're from Jersey. And my son, Idan, is 19 and is abducted to Aza. Their loved ones, all Americans, were taken by terrorists. My name is Jonathan Dekelchen. My son is Sagi Dekelchen, taken hostage by Hamas from Kibbutz near Oz on October 7th. My name is uh, Ruby Chen, uh, New York City, born and raised here with my son, Roi Chen. Uh, I am the father of Itai Chen. 19 abducted and kidnapped by Hamas. 39 days of anguish, not knowing how they are or when they might come home. My name is John Poland. My wife, Rachel Goldberg, our son Hirsch, was taken from the music festival. There are 12 of you here, but you were speaking with one voice on behalf of those who have been taken. Can you tell me how important this is to be one voice, to speak loudly on this? I mean, I think it's very important as American citizens to say it's not okay for American citizens to be stolen, kidnapped, abducted, whatever word we use. I first met John and Rachel in their home in Israel. Their 23-year-old son, Hirsch, seen here hiding from Hamas. Witnesses say he was loaded into a pickup truck, his left arm missing. I feel like kidnapped is not the right word. It's so much worse than that. When our son is dancing at a music festival, has his arm blown off and is taken, all of us together, our children, our loved ones, our American citizens who were wrongfully taken from where they were and for 39 days have been somewhere in Gaza. Their kidnapped loved ones are neighbors, mothers and fathers even a three-year-old girl. My name is Liz Hirschnoff-Tolly, and I am the grand aunt of Abigail Mori Don, and she's three years old, and she was abducted from Kibbutz Kfar Aza after her parents were both murdered. Three-year-old Abigail saw her mother killed, then her father, too. Abigail was in her father's arms, and as they ran, a terrorist shot him and killed him. And he fell onto Abigail. Abigail's six and 10 year old siblings somehow got away. They saw her hiding under their dad. And then. Abigail actually had crawled out from under her father's body. Mm. And full of his blood, went to a neighbor and they took her in. Later, Abigail and the neighbors were kidnapped. The last thing we learned was that somebody saw uh, the terrorist taking this mother, her three kids, and Abigail out of the kibbutz. And that's all we know. Yehuda, when you look around at this group, um, what do you feel? I think that what's driving all of us is a sense of hope. All of us have our own families, but now we have a new family. This is my new family. This new family now on a mission in Washington, including a meeting at the White House. Can you give us an idea of what was shared with you? Well, I, I can say this. And I think speaking for all of us, uh, we're extraordinarily grateful to the, the Biden administration as a whole for taking what is clearly such a keen interest, not just in our own loved ones, but in all of the approximately 240 hostages that were taken that day. At the end, talk is good. We want action. It's been 39 days. Where's the action? Yeah, y'all, can I ask you to help us understand what it is like not to know? 
you live every day and thinking about it and you cannot eat, you cannot sleep, you just non-stop, like, I'm thinking about it, like, when I'm going to have some message. Let's say you have kids. I do. Yeah, I'm just worried. You know worried. when they slept last night? Yeah. We don't. Now think about that yeah. for a second. It's yeah. unimaginable. It's been 39 days. We know nothing. I know you've been championing the idea of really embracing the International Red Cross in this. What are they doing or maybe not doing that you think they should be? We just would like to know, first of all, are these people alive? And if they're alive, are they getting any sort of basic medical treatment? Let's do it. There's a huge amount of pressure on Israel to supply humanitarian support to the Gaza Strip. We understand. Where is the pressure to get our kids back home? Where is the pressure to get the Red Cross in? We don't feel that pressure. I would say also, Lester, that this dilemma, this impossible challenge that we all face, it speaks to the context of, of this situation. We're dealing with, unfortunately, a murderous, savage organization, Hamas. You're surrounded by some of the posters, of course, bearing the images of your loved ones, but we have seen people tear down these kinds of posters. I, I'm just wondering what it's like to witness that. I don't understand it. I think if you listen to the stories, like we've been listening now, how can you do that? It's very hard for us to understand what you're talking about, ripping down posters. But we're here to remind everyone that we are families. We are families who don't know anything about where our loved ones are. My family is a Holocaust survivor. And I'm unfortunate to say that the feeling is somewhat like Holocaust all over again. Settlements totally burned to the ground, people burned inside of their homes. That's Holocaust, okay? And the disinformation that people are saying that this, this, this did not exist is exactly what happened in the Holocaust. No, we are the living proof that it did happen. These were people that were quietly living their lives. They were attacked. It's people that were living with heart and humanity, and it was just destroyed that day. You probably heard uh, this reporting of a potential deal in the works, uh, a swap of um, Israeli hostages for Palestinians who were being held. Does anyone take hope from that, that there is some movement? We're united in hope. We wake up every day hoping that this is going to be the day. Yep that our families come home. Pastor, and there is a the sense of urgency here. There are some sick people, injured people. Every day is precious. Every hour is precious. People will die. Americans will die. Powerful to hear straight from those families. Our thanks to Lester Holt. Coming up, more heartbreak for a Mississippi family. Why the mother of a man who was hit and killed by an off-duty cop then buried in an unmarked grave without notifying the family says she's being victimized all over again. But first, an emotional day in the courtroom is the man accused of attacking Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer takes the stand in his own defense. We're breaking it all down as closing arguments in that case are set to begin. Welcome back. Closing arguments are set to begin this morning in the trial of the man who attacked Paul Pelosi. The defense wrapped its case yesterday with David DePap taking the stand to testify in his own defense. Getting emotional at times, DePap gave a rambling explanation for the attack. He spoke about his grievances and told jurors that he spent six hours a day on YouTube looking for political commentary. And he said he regrets the attack because he felt he and Paul Pelosi had, quote, a good rapport. The defense said he never meant to hurt Nancy Pelosi or her husband. Perhaps lawyers have already admitted that their client broke into the Pelosi home and hit Paul Pelosi with a hammer, but they argue the charges do not fit. The Pap has pleaded not guilty to attempted kidnapping of a federal official and assault on the immediate family member of a federal official. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now on this. Danny, good morning. So let's just start with your reaction to all this and the fact that he did take the stand himself. Did that surprise you at all? Only two possibilities. Either the defense thought this was so hopeless they might as well put their client on on the stand mm. and see what happens. 
or the client himself insisted on taking the stand, and he has a constitutional right to do so. You take a step back, and you have similar questions as to why even take this case to trial. Well, really, two possibilities. Either the government made no offer uh, for a plea deal, or the plea deal was just not that appetizing, or, again, the client has a constitutional right to proceed to trial. So those are really only the two viable possibilities, because mm. this case is a really, really difficult case for the defense. In fact, their best chance and why they've already conceded that he was in the House and right. that he hit uh, Paul Pelosi with a hammer is because of the federal element. This is not a run-of-the-mill assault case. It's assault plus the specific intent to either intimidate or something to do with a federal official. That's why it's in federal court. Mm -hmm. Normally, these kinds of cases are handled in state court. Let's talk about the testimony. DePap was on the stand for about an hour. He swore. He cried. What stood out to you? Uh, really, what stands out to me is it goes back to the question of why put him on the stand. It could be uh, the rambling nature the defense thinks may help them with a jury to say, look, this is clearly someone who's disturbed. And then you may see them argue in the end that look at our client. He was so disturbed on the stand. How could he have formulated the specific intent to violate these federal laws? Again, that may not be an effective argument, but sometimes uh, you do what you can. The defense does not get to pick the facts. The process Prosecution does. The defense can only do the best they can with the case they have. So we mentioned that uh, his team's arguing that the charges don't fit, not that he didn't do it like you'd said. Because the attack wasn't motivated by Nancy Pelosi's position in Congress, what do you make of that? Yeah, they're essentially saying this case belongs in state court, not federal court. I mean, they've all but admitted a crime in ordinary state court, which would be an ordinary assault, an ordinary burglary. However, kidnapping can be a federal crime because of the interstate nexus. Mm. But all the same, they're saying that, look, this specific crime in federal court requires a very specific intent uh, beyond just assaulting someone. It has to be for the most of the purpose of intimidating a federal official. And they're going to argue the government simply hasn't made that burden. It's more than is usually required, and they haven't done it. It's a long shot. It's probably not going to work. In all likelihood, you can bet on a conviction in this case. What will be the prosecution's main argument in closing statements? Uh, the main argument is they'll probably trot out the same body cam video and the other avalanche of evidence they have that the defendant was in the House, did attack Paul Pelosi, Pelosi and trot out the statements that he gave, all of that together, they're going to say, look, uh, he may not have explicitly said it was for the purpose of intimidating a federal official, but ladies and gentlemen, you got everything else you need. Mm. Uh, return the correct verdict, which is one of guilty. And I think they will. All right, Danny Savellas, thanks as always. There are new questions this morning over how officials in Jackson, Mississippi, are handling the death of Dexter Wade. Six months ago, Wade was struck and killed by an off-duty police officer and later buried without his family's knowledge. When his mother went to exhume her son's body so she could give him a proper funeral, she found out he had already been moved. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett has the latest. A mother's anguish turning to anger. <laughs> Betterson Wade thought she'd finally get some peace of mind, working with Hinds County, Mississippi officials to exhume the remains of her son, Dexter, who was killed and buried without her knowing. But public works officials went ahead with the plan hours before she arrived. I didn't get to see him come from the ground. Okay, cover up. I mean, y'all keep telling me y'all didn't do it unintentionally. This is not an intention to me. But how? If this is y'all child. What would y'all think? Her son's remains had already been dug up and put into a body bag. Wade says the county made her feel like she doesn't exist and that it didn't matter she's a mother looking to honor her son. The Public Works Department did not return a request for comment. She had to fight for transparency just to get to this point. And even though it's emotional, she ain't no ways tired for us. It's almost... A funeral in reverse. Wade had filed a missing persons report in March, only to find out six months later her son had been struck and killed by an off-duty Jackson police officer while crossing a highway. He was then buried in an unmarked grave behind the county jail. Only thing I could say, Dexter, I tried to find you, and I could. I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry you are here. Jackson police have not responded to NBC's questions about the case. But according to the coroner's office, an investigator did identify Dexter and shared contact information for his mother with the police. But Betterson says she never got a call. 
At no point have we identified or did any investigation reveal that there was any police misconduct in this process and that there was any malicious intent. The premature exhumation, another insult for a grieving mother. And as her attorneys see it, a situation that now makes it impossible to know the condition in which Dexter's remains were buried. And it begs the question about all those other unknown bodies in that graveyard. How many of those families that think their loved ones are missing? We're going to get to the truth. <laughs> Not just for your son, but for other children. Our thanks to Maura Barrett for that report. Jackson's mayor has expressed regret over how this is being handled, but insists there is not any malicious intent. Dexter Wade's funeral is scheduled for next week. Well, grab your umbrellas. We are expecting more heavy rainfall across the southeast today. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is here with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. The Sunshine State not living up to its name today. Uh, we've got potential for some really heavy rainfall that's going to lead to likely some flooding concerns up and down the coast of Florida here as we get through today and potentially even tomorrow. Seven million people right now under a flood watch. It extends from Daytona Beach all the way down the coast past Homestead. So much of this area going to see uh, repeated rounds of really impressive rainfall as we go through the next 48 hours. Here's the deal right now with your radar. You can see just a big batch of moisture kind of draped across parts of the Gulf of Mexico where the heavier rain is, but also up into the southeast, Atlanta, down to Savannah, Jacksonville, Mobile, all waking up to some wet roads on that early morning commute. Now, portions of South Florida already starting to see some of that rain working in as well. And as the day goes on, that increases. It becomes um, really some potentially heavy rainfall that we'll have to see exactly how that develops later through this afternoon. But even still, I think the, the potential for some flood concerns on the afternoon commute is going to be really large. Now, as we get into tomorrow, that rain sticks around for some spots, although we will likely see this coastal low kind of develop off the coast of Florida and then track to the north. That'll impact our plans along the east coast uh, from really the Outer Banks all the way to Maine, but that's down the line. Let's focus, though, on the flooding concern first for Florida. Before we get to that, we've got hourly rainfall rates, specifically places like Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Homestead, moderate risk of flash flooding today. Those that rain coming down at a really good pace in a short amount of time. Water just doesn't have anywhere to go. It's on porous limestone. So it's easy for us to see flooding in this region. Localized amounts could be upwards of eight, nine, even 10 inches. So we'll wait and see exactly how this plays out. And again, could be iffy for that afternoon commute today. There's the low that I mentioned. It's going to kind of drag up the coast of the, the eastern coast of the United States. And it'll bring the potential for heavy rain, but also some wind as we get uh, into Saturday specifically from the Outer Banks all the way up into Maine. So this could be a little bit of a, a difficult situation here as we get into the weekend plans, something to watch. Now, moving way ahead into uh, the next couple of days and into really next week, we're going to continue to see uh, a kind of a, a system that will make a couple of loops over the Pacific and then eventually move inland on Saturday. Now, this is important because this is going to be a coast-to-coast -coast storm that will impact us for Thanksgiving week. Of course, we know lots of travel happening then. We've got rain likely across much of the eastern, really quarter or half of the country, rather, um, and the heavy rain mostly across the southeast. We'll also potentially see some snow for folks in uh, northern New England, across the Appalachians. That's going to be possible as this system tracks to the east, but it'll be something to watch, of course, when it comes to the, the travel that we'll have to deal with, guys, yeah. next week. Exactly pinpointing the timing of all this. We've still got plenty of time until then. <laughs> you don't have your Thanksgiving forecast yet? <laughs> I, knew, I knew you were going to ask for that. This, this is just a preview. Got it. A taste, More an appetizer. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and the travel is going to be a real mission. All right, yeah. Angie, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a deadly crash involving a semi truck and a charter bus filled with students. New details on the incident that Ohio's governor is calling his worst nightmare. That's next. Back now with an accident officials in Ohio are calling their worst nightmare after a semi-truck collided with a charter bus full of students. Authorities say the fiery crash sent 18 people to the hospital and killed at least six. Maggie Vespa has the story. Chaos and carnage on an Ohio interstate. We have heavy fire. Authorities say a charter bus filled with students and chaperones was apparently hit by a semi-truck. We are being advised that there is children trapped on the bus. Uh, we didn't know it was children. 
we found out later. I mean, that's, that's even harder. The investigators say it happened on a busy I-70 east of Columbus. NBC affiliate WCMH reporting the bus was carrying students from Tuscarawas Valley High School in Northeast Ohio on their way to a conference. This is uh, our worst nightmare when we have a bus full of children uh, involved in a crash. The Ohio State Highway Patrol says the crash involving five vehicles total sent 18 people to the hospital, 15 of them children. County officials confirm six people have died. Authorities declining to release names, adding they're working to reach families. Investigators closed the interstate, diverting traffic for hours. We have to break down, you know, what exactly caused the crash. The superintendent of Tuscarawas Valley Local Schools calling the news devastating and heartbreaking, writing, Our Trojan family is strong. Maggie Vespa, NBC News. The traffic nightmare in LA is going to last a while. It's going to take three to five weeks to reopen a section of Interstate 10, which was closed after it was damaged over the weekend by a massive fire. Authorities are still determining who is behind the fire that officials say happened as a result of arson. Because of the closure of the freeway, California Governor Gavin Newsom has declared a state of emergency for LA County. Coming up, new research says a simple change could help lower your blood pressure. What is it? We'll tell you what it is. Plus, with the holidays around the corner, we're digging into to the dangers of drowsy driving. Your medical checkup is just ahead. Hey, we're back with some money news. The newest Toyota Camry model is going green. CNBC Silvana Hanau has that and other financial headlines for us. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. Yeah, so Toyota's next Camry model will be sold as a hybrid only version. That's a major shift by the automaker and moving beyond the traditional gas powered engine. Toyota unveiling the redesigned 2025 Camry last night, saying the hybrid only model is part of a broader strategy to give buyers more choices in green cars. The company is also doubling down on hybrids as sales growth for full electric vehicles is slowing and other rivals have started to pull back on some of their EV plans. Online shopping is expected to surge again this holiday season, and so is the risk of your packages being stolen. A survey by CNET finds more than $74 billion worth of packages could be left on Americans' doorsteps this season, or that's an average of about $287 per household. Now, about two-thirds of consumers currently take or plan to take some sort of action to prevent theft. More than 30% will use tracking technology. 20% say they'll rely on home security cameras and about 20% will ask neighbors to watch or collect their packages. Now, about 10% of those people say they'll spend even more on top of what they've already spent just to prevent theft. And Microsoft has created what it's calling the first ever edible game controller to pair with a special Xbox Series X inspired by Willy Wonka. Now, it's part of a promotion for the upcoming film Wonka. The gamepad doesn't actually work. It's a replica made entirely of chocolate. Fans can enter to win a package which includes the Xbox console, chocolate, and a real controller and a five video game themed chocolate candies by following Xbox on X and retweeting the official sweepstakes post before December 14th. I'll eat the controller. Yeah, <laughs> just don't leave it by the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see that movie, though, by the way. All right, Savannah, thank I, you so too, much. You <laughs> Time for our weekly medical checkup. This week, we're taking a look at the dangers of drowsy driving. Plus, this is interesting, the benefits of keeping a secret. A new study suggests keeping good news to yourself could brighten your day. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us now to discuss some of these health headlines you may have missed. So let's start with sleep. The National Sleep Foundation's 2023 drowsy driving report is out. 60% of adults reported they've driven well drowsy, keeping in mind holiday travels around the corner. Remind us that this is dangerous. Exactly. This is very dangerous. And a lot of us think of driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. We know that's dangerous, but many people don't know about dry, driving while drowsy. As a matter of fact, 20% of people end up, or crashes, end up related because of drowsy oh, wow. driving. So one in five of those crashes, you think it would be teenagers. It's more adults that are in this category of driving while they're drowsy out there. So what can you do? What kind of things can you think about? Well, you know, number one, recognize you're drowsy. So one of the things you want to do is look at 
those signs for being drowsy. You're blinking more than usual as you're sitting there. You're yawning. Your eyes are wandering. You can't focus on one single thing. You have these disconnected thoughts, and you start getting aggravated while you're driving. On top of that, if you've ever had those moments where you're like, oh, how did I even get here? I don't even remember getting here. I just was driving subconsciously. That's a bad sign. Oh, definitely. Um, all right, let's talk blood pressure. So this stat always gets me. Nearly half of Americans have high blood pressure. Well, according to the American Heart Association, there's new research that shows cutting salt, but significantly is a word here, can help. How much are we talking? And it, even worse, not only do that many people not know over half or almost half of Americans not know they have high blood or have high blood pressure, but half of those don't even know they have the high okay, blood wow, pressure. So scary. everybody cutting out salt, it can be very important. And one of the things you want to do is just look at cutting a little over a te teaspoon, a teaspoon and a half, a three quarters is the one that can get you and it can get that six millimeters of mercury of that systolic pressure. So that top number can drop by 6%, which is great. So what are the doctor's orders here? Well, first and foremost, you want to skip sprinkling the salt on everything. Just get mm. rid of the salt shaker. It sounds like a huge move for a lot of people, and it was when I did this a couple of decades ago. But you find out after a while, your taste buds change, and everything starts tasting very salty, so you don't want as much salt on there. And mm. on top of that, just keep an eye on your blood pressure. It's important to know if you have it, number one, and if you need yeah. to get it treated appropriately. I, I was making dinner last night. I just looking at the recipe every Every time it's like, and add a little salt, and add a little salt, and I'm trying yeah. to be more yeah, conscious and, of and start adding less and doing less. that less. Right. Exactly. All right. So for this last study, if you're looking for a quick pick me up, maybe keeping a good secret will I energize don't know about this. you. I can't. What I can't talk this? about this. I have a long. No. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? Uh, the uh, yeah, it's interesting. I did this study. They looked at 2,500 people, and they started looking at them saying, okay, if you have secrets, if you have ideas you want to pass on to other people, what can it do? Well, most people want to end up sharing good news as soon as they get it, but they found out if you can hold on to that secret just for a little bit longer, especially if it's good news, that can really help boost your own confidence and boost your own self-esteem and boost your own mood, as hmm. a matter of fact. And on top of that, if you hold on to it and then end up sharing it with people you really want to share it with, that helps even more. And so it's not holding it on forever, but going okay. and sharing it. So what do you want to do? Well, number one, First, keep it to yourself because that's going to boost all those things. And then number two, you know, organize a surprise for people. Just say, hey, this is something. I want to tell everybody about the secret I have. I want to know it. And, and you know, we, we all love having secrets, and we all love holding on to those secrets. But sometimes it's hard to hold on to them. So. Every time you get good news, right. it's like Just Organize a out of secret closet. reveal party. Yeah. Like, <laughs> everyone, another exactly. good secret. Like, oh, I love how yeah. that was the doctor's order. Number two, organize a surprise. Organize a surprise. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, oh, they're organizing another surprise yeah. party again. Okay, okay must okay, be good secrets. news. All right. <laughs> Dr. Torres, good Thank to have you with you. us. Thank you. All right, coming up, we're continuing to remember Matthew Perry. The moving tribute by two of his friends' co-stars. Stay with us. We'll bring that to you next. Yeah, this is interesting. It's an unusual DIY home improvement project, and it's getting attention on TikTok. I don't know if you'd call it home improvement, but we'll see. It's a 30-foot-long, 20-foot-deep tunnel under a suburban house. The owner, who just wanted to be known as Kala, started a evacuating just over a year ago. Excavating. Maybe. Excavating. She told NBC News <laughs> she is using the maybe tunnel. Maybe she is. Maybe yeah, she's I'm evacuating like, Maybe that's her why house. she's doing this. I think we meant excavating there. She's using the tunnel, she says, as a storm shelter, but primarily took on the project as a challenge, saying the work keeps her preoccupied and entertained. She doesn't have an engineering background, but says she follows FEMA guidelines. She now has a third of a million followers on TikTok, where she is known as... Tunnel girl. So maybe others will think? follow suit. <laughs> I don't know. Your More storage. storage. Protection. More storage. Yeah, that's true. All Definitely right. true. Okay. Guess A little room. freaky. There you go. All right. Very good. <laughs> We're going to end this hour with the one where we say goodbye. The moving tribute from Matt LeBlanc and Courtney Cox to their friend and co-star Matthew Perry. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer shares their touching posts. You? And, and you? <laughs> Though they played friends on television, their connections were far more than just an act. You don't think we'd buy a house and not have a Joey room, do you? Oh, my God. Hey. Matt LeBlanc and Courtney Cox paying tribute to a television roommate, a co-star, and most important, a real-life friend. Matthew, it's with a heavy heart I say goodbye, writes LeBlanc. The times we had together are honestly among the favorite times of my life. Sharing a series of photos from some of their funniest scenes. You ready? Wait, wait, wait. LeBlanc and Matthew Perry's talents were only matched by their admiration for one another. LeBlanc saying, spread your wings and fly, brother. You're finally free. I'm getting married. Oh, my you think you knew I was here? Cox also shared this iconic scene with Perry, 
the cast saying goodbye publicly for the first time. I am so grateful for every moment I had with you, Maddie, and I miss you every day. It was an honor to share the stage with you and to call you my friend. I will always smile when I think of you, and I'll never forget you. Never. The best of friends till the end. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. Powerful to see all those tributes coming in from it those is. who have oh, so music, well for how so it just long. takes you right there. Exactly. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a bipartisan victory on Capitol Hill. Overnight, the House voting overwhelmingly to pass that short-term spending bill to keep the government's lights on. Will it pass in the Senate? And what comes after that? We're going to take a closer look. Also this morning, a high-stakes summit in San Francisco between President Biden and his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping. What's on the table amid a pair of global conflicts? In the Middle East, a new phase in the Israel-Hamas war is being ushered in by an Israeli siege of Gaza's main hospital. The IDF says it's carrying out a targeted operation against Hamas, while international fears grow over the safety of those needing care inside. We're on the ground in a moment. And this morning, we're celebrating something rather special here at 30 Rock, 90 years of NBC's legendary page program. And if you need any evidence of its success, ta-da! Oh, well, that was very <laughs> sweet. Yes, I was a page. I'll be taking you behind the scenes. I, it's, this year was my 10-year anniversary, which That's is kind of funny, but the program now, 90 years. That's incredible. There you go. Looking forward to that look back. All right, we're going to begin this hour in Washington, where a government shutdown looking much less likely this morning. The House passed a stopgap bill funding the government through the end of the year. The short-term spending bill is expected to pass through the Senate before President Biden signs off on it. The vote came amid rising tensions, though, among lawmakers with several confrontations on Capitol Hill. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake is here with what, of course, is another not boring day in Washington <laughs> and on Garrett's beat. Hey, Garrett, good morning. Yeah, just for the record, I wasn't involved in any of those confrontations. <laughs> but lawmakers have been in session here now in Washington for 10 straight weeks. That's an unusually long stretch of long days and nights together, precipitated by the ouster of former Speaker McCarthy. And now tensions are boiling over, even on a day of rare bipartisan agreement. The bill is passed. This morning, Congress is one step closer to avoiding a government shutdown, with the House passing a short-term funding bill with bipartisan support and days to spare before the deadline. We just had to get the job done. The bill, which now heads to the Senate, would keep the government funded through early next year. It also frees up lawmakers to leave town for Thanksgiving later this week, a badly needed break as tensions among lawmakers reached a boiling point on Tuesday. It shocked me more than anything else. Tennessee Republican Tim Burchett, who voted to oust Kevin McCarthy last month, claiming the former speaker shoved him in a basement hallway while he was being interviewed. Kevin McCarthy walked by and elbowed me in the kidneys as he walked by. Oh, it was 100% on purpose, man. What are the chances? 435 members of Congress. Paid up as voters against him. McCarthy calling any physical contact between the two men purely accidental. If I kidney punch him, he'd be on the ground. So come on. Hearings growing heated too, including a showdown in the Senate. When previous social media taunting between Teamsters President Sean O'Brien and Oklahoma Senator and former MMA fighter Mark Wayne Mullen nearly turned a health committee hearing into a cage match. Sir, this is a time, this is a place. If you want to run your mouth, we can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Big oh, hold, stop it. Is that your Sorry. solution? Every poll. No, no, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Okay. You know, you're a United States senator. Sit down. Active. Oh, okay. okay. Sit down, please. Unlikely referee 82 year old Bernie you. Sanders intervening. Senator Mullen unapologetic afterwards. You don't do that in Oklahoma. You don't run your mouth unless you're going to answer the call. But with the government funding bill through one chamber and on a glide path in the other, lawmakers are eyeing a long Thanksgiving break, being away from one another, something they will likely all be thankful for. There are dumb days on, on Capitol Hill and there are dumber days on Capitol Hill. And this is one of the dumbest I've seen in quite a long time. Well, Garrett, we weren't lying, wasn't boring, but let's get back to the business. The funding bill now headed to the Senate. Walk us through what happens next. 
Yeah, look, the fact that this House vote was so strongly bipartisan is probably a good sign for the pending Senate vote. I would expect to see that uh, tomorrow. Plenty of time left until the deadline. But it may be a bad sign longer term for the new Speaker Mike Johnson. He got fewer Republican votes on this spending bill than McCarthy did on the last one, which was also part of the reason McCarthy lost his job. Got a lot of conservatives now frustrated with another short-term deal here with no spending cuts. So good news for the country, for the spending bill, but potentially the honey moon for the House Speaker looks over. Savannah? All right, Garrett, thank you so much. I'm going to pitch in and buy Garrett a helmet yeah. now. All right, turning now to that highly anticipated meeting between President Biden and China's President Xi. Both leaders will hold talks in San Francisco today in a bid to thaw relations, which have turned frosty over a series of global issues. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has more from San Francisco. Good morning to you for President Biden. Today's high stakes summit is part of an effort to restore one of the world's most consequential relationships, a tense rivalry that has been in a downward spiral for years. And for China's President Xi, this is his first visit to the United States in six years. Their sit down summit this afternoon expected to last several hours, a meeting that for both sides offers opportunities and risks. It'll be their first face-to-face -face visit in a year. President Biden and China's President Xi Jinping arriving in San Francisco ahead of today's highly anticipated summit between the world's two biggest economic superpowers. What we're trying to do is change the relationship for the better. The president detailing his desire to simply stabilize a relationship that's reached its lowest point in decades. To get back on a normal course of corresponding, being able to pick up a phone and talk to one another is a crisis being able to make sure our military still have contact with one another. Tensions have escalated since their last meeting, punctuated by the U.S. shooting down that Chinese spy balloon and a collapse in military-to-military -military talks. While downplaying the likelihood of any major breakthroughs here, White House advisors are emphasizing their effort to manage competition between the two countries so it does not descend into conflict. The way we achieve that is through intense diplomacy. That's how we clear up misperceptions and avoid surprises. Among the thorniest issues to be addressed, China's close ties to Russia and Iran, its combative approach toward Taiwan, and disputes over the theft of technology, hacking, and trade. One possibility for new cooperation on the opioid crisis, where the president is hoping to establish a joint partnership to tackle the illegal flow of fentanyl from China. Every aspect of the Chinese president's visit here to the United States has been highly choreographed from what he sees out the windows of his motorcade to the camera angles that he shot at during today's meeting. Biden administration officials have spent months trying to reduce tensions with China, which is why the U.S. is also invested in China's President Xi viewing this visit as a success. Back to you. All right, Peter, thank you so much. For more on this meeting, let's bring in Gordon Cheng. He's the author of several books on U.S.-China relations, including The Great U.S.-China Tech War. Gordon, thank you very much for joining us on this this morning. So before we get into today's meeting, just give us some context to remind us why relations between the two countries are at such a low point right now. Well, China has been engaged in clearly unacceptable and dangerous conduct for a very long time. And the United States, for more than three decades, has had intensive diplomacy with China trying to move China into the international system to become a responsible stakeholder in it, as the State Department said in 2005. But unfortunately, China's moved in very bad directions, especially under Xi Jinping. And, you know, it's not just Ukraine. It's not just Iran. It's not just fentanyl. It's not just COVID. It's the range of things. And so, therefore, the Biden administration believes it can talk to China. But the issue is, what can President Biden say that has not been said for more than three decades? So Peter Alexander just mentioned that the White House is downplaying the likelihood of any major expectations. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, what kind of progress can be made today? What are you watching out for? Well, the Chinese are going to try to delay the United States from imposing costs, which costs which we should be imposing because they have not honored, for instance, previous promises. So, yes, we can talk to them about fentanyl, but we've got to recognize that the Chinese run a near total surveillance state. These large, well-organized Chinese fentanyl gangs couldn't operate without the approval of the Communist Party. Chinese diplomats provide cover to the fentanyl gangs. The gangs launder their proceeds through the Chinese state banking system. Um, we don't want to recognize the horrible reality that this is a Communist Party policy to send fentanyl into the United States. 
Last week, actually, U.S. and Chinese officials had met in Washington that included some arms control talks, and I know those were widely seen as a positive step to reduce tensions. But we're also seeing on our screen here something that you've recently written. This is a piece for Newsweek discussing what you think those talks actually mean. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think what China was trying to do was to create a positive atmosphere for these talks. And the reason is that the Chinese economy is not growing at the 5.2% pace that they claimed for the first three quarters of this year. Um, we just got price information on Thursday that showed China is in deflation, which means China can't be growing at a robust pace. And I think really what Xi Jinping wants to do is try to string the Biden administration along as it strung along the predecessors for President Biden. And so this is, again, we have seen this so many times, uh, and that's unfortunate. Now, they're going to have this agreement on AI and nuclear weapons, but we got to see the text of it because it looks like it's going to be another unenforceable agreement, and that's not going to work out for the United States when we talk about nuclear weapons. All right. Gordon Chang, thank you very much for joining us on this. Turning now to Gaza, where Israeli defense forces say they have started a targeted operation at the El Shifa hospital. According to Israeli officials, the militant group is using tunnels underneath the hospital to hide hostages and carry out attacks against troops. Both Hamas and Al Shifa staff deny the accusations. But the situation inside Al Shifa remains dire. The hospital is no longer operational, despite the hundreds of people trapped inside looking for immediate care. Doctors are pleading for help and for a ceasefire. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us now from Tel Aviv with the very latest. So, Keir, walk us through the situation unfolding both inside and right outside of Al Shifa. What are we learning about this operation? Communications are really challenging. It's, we've been trying to get through with. We've spoken to people in Al Shifa hospital doctors on a regular basis. It isn't easy. We got one call through that lasted kind of 10 seconds. So, what we're told by the uh, Gaza Health organization which is run by Hamas is that it began around 2 a.m. this morning Israeli soldiers uh, raided uh, the hospital it says that there are 650 patients 400 medical staff and thousands of displaced people in the Al Shifa area um, and that they say that they have been questioned for 10 hours uh, and some people uh, taken away now the Israeli defense force uh, has said that it is operating uh, this conducting this operation based on intelligence information that is precise and targeted and is against Hamas in a specified area of the Al Shifa hospital. And the IDF has released a video of uh, Israeli soldiers carrying medical supplies and equipment into Al Shifa hospital. So uh, there, is, uh, there are different perspectives, clearly, uh, as ever. Every, uh, it's been this way for, for so many years in this part of the world, and certainly in the past, weeks it's been this way uh, that you get two sides uh, to the to what's to what's happening both sides pushing really hard for their version to be to be the the, the, the narrative that people accept Thank you. we've also heard from the hospital's director telling nbc news that doctors have started digging mass graves to bury the bodies of the dead what are we hearing at this point from those still inside about just how how bad these conditions are the conditions are very bad. Uh, the hospital has lost power. Uh, we know, of course, that uh, a lot of the Gaza Strip has lost power because it hasn't had fuel. Uh, again, the Israelis would say that uh, Hamas has fuel and isn't sharing it. Uh, but the hospital certainly has been in that position. And, of course, um, that image of those uh, babies uh, not able to be in incubators anymore, those premature babies, 36 of them, three di have died. Uh, those images really kind of sum it up, don't they? Because uh, the innocence of these children faced with a situation where they just can't, they're not getting the care they need, uh, it, it has been seen around the world. Uh, as another example, the Israelis have put out images of, uh, of beds for these, these children, incubators for these children, uh, but it's not clear whether and how they actually plan to get them to Al Shifa. Perhaps they're on their way there now. We don't know. The key of this IDF operation came just hours after the White House announced it had information confirming that Hamas and other militants in Gaza used tunnels under hospitals to try and keep the hostages. What are yeah. we hearing from President Biden when it comes to hospitals in Gaza? And how are Hamas and other neighboring countries responding to what the White House is saying? Well, Hamas has denied that 
claim for a long time. Uh, the Israelis have insisted on it for a long time. This is the first time that we've heard the White House come out and say it has the intelligence in public. It has the intelligence to confirm what the Israelis are saying. At the same time, after the operation was announced, the Israeli operation, National Security Council putting out a statement saying we do not, and this is just, a, just some of the statement, we do not want to see a firefight in a hospital where innocent people, helpless people, sick people, trying to get medical care they deserve, are caught in the crossfire. So clearly the administration kind of, if you like, walking a line between supporting what the Israelis are saying and I think the question now will be that the world will be watching to see whether the Israelis come up with evidence um, of what they've made, said is the case at Al-Shifa. The line between that and uh, the internationally agreed protection of places uh, like hospitals, which has, and you asked, to, to answer the second part of your question, has many people very, very concerned. The World Health Organization, Health Organization saying it's concerned. Jordan suggesting targeting a hospital is, is a war crime, although we should add, of course, that the United Nations uh, says that the Hamas uh, terror attack on October 7th uh, and the holding of hostages are also war crimes. All right. Kier Simmons reporting from Tel Aviv. Mm. Kier, thank you. Thank you, as always. Well, back in the States, tens of thousands of people marched in Washington yesterday to show their support for Israel. Demonstrators called for the release of the hostages and an end to anti-Semitism in the U.S. in light of the rise of attacks since the war against Hamas began six weeks ago. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the details. With tens of thousands of people from across the country taking part, Jewish leaders are calling Tuesday's March for Israel the largest rally of its kind in the U.S. since the war began. For many here, it's deeply personal. I grew up a very strong Jewish identity, and um, Israel and my Jewishness always meant so much to me. Among the speakers, families of Hamas's hostages. We all have third-degree burns on our souls. Rachel Goldberg's 23-year-old son, missing since October 7th. Why? Why is the world accepting that 240 human beings from almost 30 countries have been stolen and buried alive? President Biden telling those families to hang in there. I'm talking with the and people involved every single day. I believe it's going to happen, but I don't want to get into detail. Hetty Milgram came here all the way from Cleveland. It's still surreal. It, it is, um, it's, it's haunting all of us. Her parents survived the Holocaust. It's painful to see so many innocent Palestinians dying. And at the same time, there is, there is a terrorist nation that is out to destroy the Jewish people. Still, tensions remain high on college campuses. At Columbia University Tuesday, a rally supporting two student groups that were suspended for the fall semester after what the school calls an unauthorized event in support of Palestinians. While Cornell students who travel to D.C. say there's still fear on campus weeks after prosecutors charged a student with making violent online anti-Semitic threats. What began with uh, hate speech against the Jews has really just transformed into um, incitement of violence and action against Jews. Now, our thanks to Gabe Gutierrez for that report. The Department of Homeland Security has raised the security threat level for the march in Washington, but D.C.'s police chief said overnight that the march for Israel remained peaceful. Well, this morning, we are taking a closer look at the latest news on inflation. Overall prices stayed the same from September to October, according to the government's consumer price index. And the year-over-year -year inflation rate rising 3.2 percent, a big improvement from 3.7 percent the month before. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans is here to explain. So overall, can we call this good news, not bad news? What do we say? <laughs> well, it's much better than 9.1%. That was the worst in this inflation nightmare. So you look at how much inflation has come down from that peak, and it is it is a noticeable deceleration of inflation, 3.2% there. And we saw in this particular report, month to month, as you mentioned, consumer prices didn't rise at all. And that was something that was really important for economists to see. It means that that
that inflation fire might be uh, burning down here because of those months and months and months of higher interest rates to try to stop it. One thing that's on a lot of people's mind, especially right now with Thanksgiving about a week that's away, right. groceries, what are we seeing when it comes to those So prices? this is why people are so frustrated when I say the inflation situation is getting better and the economy is still strong and the American public says, well, I don't feel it. And groceries are a big reason for that. Grocery prices are still higher year over year. I mean, cereal and bakery products, for example, in this government report, up more than 4%. And you look at milk. This is a good example. Milk spiked um, to about $4.43 a gallon and has come off from there. So that's that inflation improvement. But compare that to 20, 2021. When you go to the grocery store, you know, you still know that your grocery bill is higher today than it was a couple of years ago. And that's been wearing on optimism for American consumers. And milk is something that nearly everyone is buying and that's needs right. and notices. So let's talk about travel because we've got holiday travel sure. ahead. And we talk a lot about air travel, but really Thanksgiving is still a driving holiday for most people. So they're thinking about gas prices. Right. How are they looking right now? So gas prices are down over the past year. It's one of the reasons why this inflation number was a little cooler than many expected, because gas prices are down. And so that's good news into the holiday uh, travel season. I'll say a lot of people will be traveling. So <laughs> use that terrible cliche, pack your patience, because the roads and the airports will be full. Airfares are also declining, we saw in this government report as well. And that might, Joe, be because the consumer went crazy over the summer, you know, bought and traveled and, and really was spending with abandon. And now heading into the end of the year, maybe a little more cautious, cooling a little bit, a good thing. And so that means airfares are coming down as the airlines are trying to get their business. Well, we're on the topic of holidays. We're thinking about holiday shopping. What is the mood of customers now as we head into this period? You know, the surveys show that customers are aware that inflation is still biting and they are going to make their choices this holiday season with that in mind, inflation in mind. That said, you know, consumers say they feel lousy about the economy, but they don't show it. <laughs> they have been spending their money. So we'll have a retail sales number later this morning. I'm going to be very curious to see if if the consumer is wisely pulling back a little bit after spending a year uh, like crazy for the past year. We like to complain and spend, I guess, right? Is that... I guess it's retail therapy, <laughs> right? You know, there you go. <laughs> I feel real rotten about politics and the direction of the world and two wars. So I'm going to go to the mall. There's fighting breaking out on Capitol Hill. I'm going to buy myself something. Nice. Exactly. All right. I need some sneakers. <laughs> Exactly. Christine Romans, good to see you. Thank nice you so much you, for joining us this morning. We've got more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including an arrest that was made in the shocking death of that former NHL player over in England. The latest on that investigation in a moment. But first, after the break, a troubling new report on climate change and how it's now affecting Americans' daily lives. We're going to dig into the data next. Welcome back. The effects of climate change are spreading throughout Americans' daily lives in all regions. That is a troubling conclusion from the latest National Climate Assessment, which was just released yesterday. The report also warns the U.S. is warming about 60 percent faster than the world as a whole. A startling number. Let's bring in Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who contributed to that report. She's the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy and a distinguished professor at Texas Tech University. Dr. Hayhoe, thank you so much for joining us this morning. So this is the fifth report of its kind. There's a lot to unpack. Take us through the biggest ways people are now feeling the differences in today's climate. So often we refer to climate change as global warming, which is the increase in the average temperature of the planet. But the way you and I as individuals often experience this is through what I call global weirding. Wherever we live, things are getting weird. Our heat wave season is starting earlier in the year. Heat waves persist at dangerous levels throughout the summer. Hurricanes are ramping up from a tropical storm to a category three, four, or five seemingly overnight. Heavy downpours and flash floods are increasing. Wherever we look, our weather is getting weirder and climate change is to blame. So how does this year's assessment compare to some of the earlier national assessments? I've been a lead author on the second, third and fourth and now an author on the fifth assessment. So I can tell you exactly what's changed. First of all, we can now put a number on how much worse climate change made a specific event. How many more acres were burned by wildfire? How much more land was flooded by heavy rainfall? We also know how interconnected these impacts are, how they affect every aspect of our society. And we know that while they affect us all, they don't affect us all equally. 
people who are already marginalized and vulnerable living in low income urban neighborhoods, those are often those who are on the front lines of these impacts. And that's not fair. Why is that? Why is it climate change is affecting more people in marginalized communities? Well, because if you already can't afford to live anywhere except a floodplain, when the rain comes, you're the first to be flooded. If you already live in a concrete jungle with no vegetation or trees, you're going to be up to 15 degrees Fahrenheit hotter during a heat wave than a wealthier, greener neighborhood in the same city. So as we said, the report shows climate change is affecting all regions of the U.S. There's a graphic from the report that shows how much more likely we'll experience hazardous weather events in North America as the Earth warms at dangerous levels. In your mind, what urgently needs to happen to prepare and reverse these changes that we're seeing? There are three things we need to do, and they are very clear. The report is also clear that many of these are already happening, just not fast enough. So we're moving in the right direction. We have to speed it up. Number one, we have to cut and reduce our heat trapping gas emissions that are causing this problem in the first place. Number two, we need to invest in nature to help protect us from many of these storms, floods, and heat, as well as to take some of the extra carbon out of the atmosphere. Number three, we need to build resilience to the changes that have already happened because today climate is changing faster than any time in human history. And it is not about saving the planet. It is about saving us, us humans, and many of the other species that share this planet with us, we're the ones at risk. Just at a smaller level, just what can everyday folks do in their everyday lives that can make a difference? Well, that is such an important question that I pin that to the top of my Instagram account and my Twitter account. The number one thing that we can do as individuals has nothing to do with light bulbs or diet. It is to use our voices to call for and advocate for change where we live, where we work, where we study, where we bank, where we worship. How does change begin? It begins when someone says, hey, this matters to us here and now, not in the future. And here's what we working together could do to make a difference. And that type of change has already been catalyzed all across the country by people using their voices. All right. Dr. Catherine Hayo, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Such an important report. We're grateful you're able to help us break it down. Thank you for having me. Speaking of climate, let's get into your morning news now forecast. Angie Lastman is back with a look ahead. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. We've got some rain in the forecast for the southeast. That's what we're going to focus on today. But we've also got that really warm and kind of pleasant weather settling into the middle of the country. You can expect temperatures anywhere from the 70s to mid to even upper 70s in some spots across the central plains, across the Midwest. Mid 60s it is for our friends in Chicago today. A little bit of rain is going to develop out in California, and we'll kind of see that throughout the the next couple of days and even into next week as more rain is on the way as the system develops offshore. But it's it's the flooding concern that we have today across specifically Florida that will really get your attention. If you live anywhere from Daytona Beach down to Homestead, we are dealing with those flood watches already this morning. This includes 7 million people and we've got heavy rain on the way that will likely lead to some issues, especially during the time of that afternoon commute. Here's what it looks like right now with your radar across the southeast. You can see that heavy rain mostly out into portions of the Gulf of Mexico, but from Savannah to Atlanta, out to Jackson, Mobile, New Orleans, in and out of the rain this morning. And now with the state of Florida starting to see some of that working uh, north, especially if you live in South Florida, that's where the heaviest of the rain will be today. Here's the system that we've been watching. It's kind of hanging out into uh, the Gulf of Mexico, but we're eventually going to see another low start to develop here just offshore of Florida. Either way, it keeps us really unsettled, and we've got a lot of moisture to tap into. So some really impressive rainfall rates are possible through today and into early tomorrow. Tomorrow. You can see that coastal low that we'll be watching develop and then eventually move up the coast and impact folks from the Outer Banks all the way to Maine over the weekend. But first, we've got to get through the next couple of days in Florida and impressive rainfall amounts, uh, to say the least. This is in a short period of time. We know it easily floods in this region, Miami, Fort Lauderdale included. And we could see anywhere from probably widespread amounts, three to five inches of rain, but upwards of seven, eight, nine, even 10 inches of rain are possible uh, with all of this moisture. 
on deck. Now, as we get into the weekend, we'll see that low start to skirt up the East Coast uh, over the next couple of days. And that does bring some shower activity to folks, uh, again, from the Outer Banks all the way up into Maine. You can see some cooler weather on the way as well. But look at Saturday in the middle of the country. Temperatures, of course, have come down just a little bit compared to where they are right now. But we're still going to be into the upper 60s here across uh, much of that area. And we'll end up in uh, dealing with plenty of sunshine as well. Now, out west, we've got wet weather on deck. And this is going to be a system that we'll watch move across the country over the next uh, week or so, impacting folks potentially for some travel for Thanksgiving. You can see it moves into uh, portions of the Rockies, brings us some rain as we get into Sunday for the Central Plains. The Southeast will finally get a plenty of sunshine on deck for Sunday, so it'll be a nice kind of break from all of that rain um, that they're dealing with. And the chilly and breezy conditions will last across the Midwest and the Northeast with a couple of snow showers on Sunday in northern New England, Joe. I like a sky full of sun. Me too. Just a sky of sun. I can use that right about now. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. Of course. Coming up, we have new developments this morning in the shocking death of a former NHL player who was fatally cut by a skate during a game in England last month. We're going to tell you more about an arrest that's been made and what could be next for that investigation. Stick around. Welcome back. This morning, there are new developments tied to a death during a professional hockey game in England that shocked hockey fans around the world. Adam Johnson, a former NHL player who was playing overseas, suffered a fatal cut to his neck from a skate blade. Authorities arrested a man. This morning, he's out on bail. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Cobiea joins us with more on this one. Kelly, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. Police here have not named the man, and he has not been charged. As you said, he was released on bail just this morning. In announcing the arrest, police called Adam Johnson's death unprecedented and a tragedy. The death of former NHL player Adam Johnson left his family and fans heartbroken and shocked. I just think it's awful. We really are one big family. Now, police are investigating whether what happened on the ice October 28th was manslaughter. This video showing the moments before Johnson was injured, when the skate of an opposing player cut him in the neck. The 29-year-old from Minnesota was pronounced dead at the hospital. The other player, 31-year-old Canadian Matt Pettigrave. Johnson's aunt, watching from Minnesota, spoke to Sky News before the arrest. Yeah, we've seen people get cut in hockey, uh, maybe when they've been... They've been down on the ice. Have you ever seen this get us, you know, get us skate to the neck like that? Never. South Yorkshire police say they've been carrying out extensive enquiries to piece together the events which led to the loss of Adam and consulted highly specialized experts in their field. The person arrested on suspicion of manslaughter has been released on bail this morning. Police saying the investigation continues. The question whether any player's actions were an accident or criminal. Manslaughter cases invariably don't uh, have any intention to kill. What has happened is that through someone's negligence or indeed their extreme negligence, they have uh, caused the loss of somebody's life. The tragic death putting a spotlight on safety. The coroner releasing a report calling for more protections, writing that deaths may occur in the future if neck guards or protectors are not worn. It took something like this to get people to really think about safety issues in the game. Adam was a great teammate, friend, and member of the Penguins family. In Johnson's hometown of Hibbing, Minnesota, a celebration of his life last week, his partner paying tribute. To me, you were everything. You were my home, my best friend, my sounding board, my rock, my safe haven, and the love of my life. We were unable to reach Petgrave's agent overnight. Johnson's team here in England said his death was a tragic accident. They've now etched his name into the ice at the home arena and are playing a memorial game in his honor this Saturday. Joe. All right, Kelly, thank you so much. NBC News legal analyst Angela Sanadella joins us now for a closer look, because I think a lot of people have a lot of questions about this after watching that story. So we know suspect has not been named, no charges have been filed yet. But just overall, I mean, how rare is it to see someone arrested or charged for something that happened 
during a sporting event like this. It is extremely rare, but manslaughter can happen anywhere at any time. And that is why you hear the authorities saying that they are consulting experts in the field. Because what really matters is the industry standard. So at that time, in a hockey game, what would someone else have done? Was it really an accident? How reckless was it? Because look, even though they've said manslaughter is likely what the charge would be, there's different types of manslaughter, involuntary, voluntary. What will they charge? So do they need to prove that it wasn't an accident, that there was some intent here, or do they not need to prove so that? So that's the difference between voluntary and involuntary manslaughter. There does not need to be any intent required for involuntary manslaughter. But that means that there was a conscious disregard for life, that it was so reckless that that's why the death happened. With the legal expert we heard in the piece there from Kelly mentioned negligence or extreme negligence. How could that play into this? Yes, so negligence is essentially the same thing as recklessness. So that's why you look at what happens in a hockey game. It's not just like you and me sitting here. Would I accidentally hit you in the face with a skate? It's in a hockey game in that context. What is normal? What is not normal? What is an extreme conscious disregard for life? And what is truly just an accident? So that video, for example, will be played over and over in front of a and that video is a little bit blurry, so it is kind of hard to tell what's going on. We should know police released a statement after the man was released on bail saying our investigation continues and we will provide further updates as and when we can. What do you expect is going on behind the scenes right now? So I expect they're consulting everyone in the field, trying to see if there were other cameras, other photos, maybe people who had cell phone footage at the time to get as close a look as possible. Because in a manslaughter case like this, it's literally the details that matter. All right, Angela Senadella breaking it down for us. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Coming up, it is Transgender Awareness Week. And after the break, we're going to have an open conversation on the importance of recognizing, understanding, and supporting the trans community while speaking to some of the issues that trans people still face. That's coming up next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. If you were thinking about signing up for OpenAI, well, now you may have to wait. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yeah, so OpenAI has stopped accepting new users for its paid chat GPT plus service, and that's because of overwhelming demand. So the company introduced new features at its first developers conference last week, including allowing people to build custom versions of ChatGPT with no coding required. OpenAI says roughly 100 million people use its services every week, and more than 90% of Fortune 500 companies are building tools on its platform. Airbnb has bought its very own AI company. Sources telling CNBC it has snapped up a startup called Game Planner, which was founded in 2020 by one of the creators of Siri. Airbnb CEO has said generative AI will radically change the platform. He wants to use it as a travel concierge that learns about users over time and enhances their travel experiences, such as matching them with the right homes or rooms. And Polestar wants to make the rear window obsolete. The Swedish electric vehicle maker unveiling the Polestar 4 model. Instead of a rear window, it uses a camera system on the roof to project images to the digital rear view mirror. The cameras offer a 120 degree field of view and the lenses are dust and waterproof. Now, if you want to check out what's happening in the back seat, you can flip a switch to turn off the display and use it as an actual mirror. I think I take, I'll take the mirror. I need the screen. I need to see real. I know. I feel like I'd be confused or claustrophobic <laughs> Me <too>. or yes. something. <laughs> I would totally be confused, Joe. I would All be right. very confused. We'll see if it catches on. My, my gut says no. Thanks, Silvana. Appreciate it. <laughs> Morning News Now is recognizing Transgender Awareness Week. It's a time when people and organizations nationwide work to help increase understanding about transgender people and the issues the community faces. This year alone, the Human Rights Campaign says at least 25 transgender and gender nonconforming people have lost their lives to violence. 88% of the victims were people of color. 52% were black transgender women. Raquel Willis joins us now for more on this. She's an award-winning author, activist, and media strategist. Her new podcast, After Lives, launches today. Her book, The Risk It Takes to Bloom, was just released yesterday. You are busy this week, Raquel. I'm very busy. It is a miracle I'm here. It is good to have you with us. We've spoken before via Zoom, so it's great to see you in person. I do want to start with these numbers because 
We see them every year released by HRC, which keeps a running tally. That number 25, sadly, it's not a surprising number, is it? But what's your reaction when you hear that? Well, it's always very difficult to hear about the murders of people who have very similar and overlapping experiences as I do. Um, I think as a black trans woman, unfortunately, death has been a feature of so many of our lives in terms of the folks that we've lost in community. And I talk about that a lot in the book, you know, what it's like to kind of grapple with being someone who is under threat and also surviving and also invested in trying to elevate the stories of those who've been taken too soon. The fact that a majority of the people are are people of color. Um, mm. Help us understand why that might be and what can maybe be done to change that. Yeah, well, I think it's about understanding the kind of compounding factors around marginalization. So when I think about the experiences of black trans folks, we're often thinking about higher rates of uh, mental uh, health considerations. Of course, thinking about some high rates for black trans and non-binary youth around suicidal ideation. But of course, just thinking about barriers in terms of employment, education, access to health care, and so much more. So. There are so many factors conspiring against us, um, but I, I do think it's important as well to understand that folks are not waiting to be saved. We have powerful leaders, organizers, and activists in our communities who need their efforts supported. What, what type of change have you seen when it comes to that, to having a voice in recent years? Yeah, well, the visibility piece, right, mm -hmm. I think is often the thing that folks maybe who are not trans see and they're, they have this idea that, okay, well, maybe things have been figured out because we see y'all now. But that visibility isn't the same as vitality. That doesn't mean that the resources have been put in to make sure that we can live our lives safely and move freely throughout the world. So I think there's still a lot of ignorance. We see some of it stoked by political figures, of course, especially mm -hmm. right now. And then, of course, we're seeing upwards of 600 pieces of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation being moved across the country. So again, we have so many factors that are conspiring to make our lives more difficult. We talk about visibility. Transgender Awareness Week takes place the week before Transgender Day of Remembrance. That's mm -hmm. November 20th. Explain the significance of this day. Yeah, so Trans Day of Remembrance is often a difficult day, but it is a necessary day for us to mourn and grieve those folks that we've lost and hopefully highlight the systems of oppression um, that maybe have led to folks' demise. Um, when I think about today and how important it is, that we're releasing Afterlives with iHeartMedia's Outspoken Network and School of Humans. We are centering trans stories of folks who have been taken too soon because of violence. And at the center of this first season is Laylene Polanco, a 27-year-old Afro-Latina who died in Rikers custody. And so we're not just talking about intimate partner violence or domestic violence, but we're also talking about the violence that happens in state custody. We have about a minute left here. I want to give you a chance to talk about both the book and the of podcast. Course. What I know, we know, we have the book here. <laughs> you brought it with. Yes, <laughs> well, my book, The Risk It Takes to Bloom, it's all about my experience as a black trans woman from the South. I'm from Augusta, Georgia, if you can not tell by the accent. <laughs> um, so that's such a feature of my experience, but I talk about the difficulties of not meeting gender expectations growing up, what that was like with my parents. But I also talk about what it's been like to navigate a career in storytelling and social justice. And so it's a great read, if I do say so myself. <laughs> I, I put believe a lot you. of heart and soul into it. <laughs> and the podcast, real quickly? And the podcast is After Lives. So please look it up on wherever you get amazing, brilliantly reported podcasts. Well, you are an inspiration to so many and a voice that we turn to so often when it comes to talking about these issues honestly and candidly. Raquel Willis, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We thank really appreciate you. it. Coming up, it is quite a special time of year here at 30 Rock. The tree is here, the holidays are right around the corner, and this month, believe it or not, marks the 90th anniversary of NBC's legendary Page program. After the break, Savannah's taking us behind the peacock's feathers, if you will, with a look at what makes it so special. Stick around.
If you're still deciding what pie to serve for your Thanksgiving meal next week, Google has some data on what we've all been searching for. Google Trends has published this map showing the most searched pies in each state over the last 30 days. It shows New York and California have gone for the traditional pecan, or perhaps you'll say pecan pie. Well, some of the mountain states are into key lime pie. People in Louisiana have been searching for Mississippi mud pie, while those in Mississippi are going for chocolate. You can see the list here of the most searched nationwide with apple coming out on top overall. And of course, pumpkin is number one in my household. So. Well, apple is the best, obviously. So it's good to see it's number one. I, when you didn't say it was part of any states, I was like, what? Who's not wanting apple pie? But it's number one. There you go. Yep. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Well, we have something special to celebrate this morning. From the trademark uniforms to the guided tours, the pages are a staple of NBC, and this month marks the program's 90th anniversary. As a career development opportunity, the page program also introduces young talent to every division of NBC Universal. It also just so happens to be where I got my start. It's amazing the kind of NBC trivia I saw floating around in my head after being part of the page program. And I got to talk to some current pages about the program and even hop on a tour. In the heart of Manhattan, there's a building synonymous with the pinnacle of TV production. Late night comedy, daytime talk, hard hitting news. It's also home to the Page Program, celebrating its milestone 90th anniversary this month. Actually, a program I was part of early in my career. Let's head up into 30 Rock and see what it's all about. And here's a little page humor for you. Don't step on the peacocks. Founded in 1933, the Page Program was created to expose young people to the television industry and bring in an eager workforce to help power production. On 30 Rock, Kenneth, the fictional page, was a scene stealer. I just don't want to disgrace the peacock. And in reality, the program has turned out some superstars with pages making it to the top ranks of media and even in front of the camera. Famous faces to pass through include Aubrey Plaza and late TV legends Regis Philbin and Willard Scott. Currently, thousands apply each year for the coveted 125 positions split between the East and West Coast. I just remember being stressed in that interview. <laughs> yeah. It is pretty intense, but it made it that much more worth it when I found out that I did get into the program. Do you remember your first time in 30 Rock? It's hard <laughs> not to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once you get into the program, the real work begins. Pages get assignments at places like CNBC, NBC News, NBC Sports, and right here at the iconic SNL page desk, something you might have seen before. Of course, right here is our page desk. I was what they called a bad page. A rite of passage for a page, donning the iconic suit that's seen nine variations over the years. It's getting tailored and getting the uniforms shined on. And the hope for many of these pages once their year-long program is complete, a career at NBC. Definitely something in news and journalism. One of my favorite parts of being a page was giving the studio tours. But in order to be tour certified, a page has to pass the notoriously difficult NBC trivia test. Which NBC president created the concept for the first broadcast of the Today Show? Pat Weaver. There you Weaver. go. Yep. Which notes make up the melody of the NBC chimes? E C. E <laughs> what is the order of the Tonight Show hosts? Ooh, Ooh we know this. Steve, Steve Allen. Allen. Jack, Jack Carr, Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, Conan O'Brien, Jay Leno, Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> All that trivia talk had me wondering just how I would do back on a tour. So I studied up and joined a tour to the most famous studio in 30 Rock. Welcome to Studio 8H, the home of Saturday Night Live. But does anyone know what this studio was originally used for? I can actually take that one. Oh, thank you. This was home to the NBC Symphony Orchestra, led by Arturo Toscanini, starting in 1937. <laughs> okay, so maybe I didn't always get applause while giving tours, but spending time with our NBC pages as the program turns 90 years old showed me the future around here is looking bright. There's no like cookie cutter page. They want diverse experiences and diverse people with different backgrounds. So anyone that's interested should apply because you never know. Well, I had to don the classic blazer. <laughs> there it is. The uniform. Did you get to keep those? No, oh, you okay. don't. I know, which is kind of sad, but good question. Uh, but it's very fun when you get to get one, as I said, and there's a sort of rite of passage for pages. And there's been thousands of people who have gone through the program, hundreds in it currently, and so many people here 
who continue to stay at NBC, which is really cool. About right, the program. right, exactly. Meet so many people. Everybody who worked on this story actually was a page oh, producer, cool. the senior producer. This is very cool. So. What a way to, to start out in this building. Well, you know very I mean? cool. It got everyone in here, and they keep the place running. Yes, the I know. They are, they are the engine here at 30 Rock, exactly. as we like to call ourselves. All right. Congratulations, and happy 90th. Thank you so much. It's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app, or follow us on social media.